Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast. Subnautical podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 130, Custo Curio. Yes, we are going down beneath the waves today. Uh, we're going to club a few sharks. We're going to blow up a few reefs. <laughs> we're going uh, right there from the top, huh? Stay tuned, just, everybody. Animals were harmed in the making of this episode. Yeah, animals were very harmed in the making of this episode. Um, not in a way we, we don't condone this. Uh, we condemn it. Uh, but yeah. and, and, and Jacques Cousteau definitely grew over time. He was kind of like at the cutting edge of kind of uh, uh, developing mer- a lot of marine biology and studies under the waters and kind of eventually became one of the guys who's like helping to um, like essentially – Tell, tell, explain, or develop this way in which we treat animals today, in which we want to, you know, we, we don't treat them like shit anymore, or we, we try not to treat them like poop anymore. Uh, but unfortunately, we say chum. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> um, there's a uh, they're, they're definitely part of that generation of people who I, it feels like they should have known better. Uh, but they definitely just went around kind of yeah. treating the world like crap, I guess. I don't know. A lot of power went to a lot of people who didn't have power before in, over the course of the 20th century. And that kind of has a lot of crazy effects that we kind of take for granted today because now we know how to manage mm-hmm. uh, a lot of our effects on the world around us. But anyway, anyway. And it's interesting to put that in context of like Jacques Cousteau and how he fits into the kind of evolution of ecology and, and this kind of stuff because he was – you know, sort of a scientist, but mostly like an entertainer. And we'll talk about how all that comes into play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of this episode, I feel like, is going to be mostly documentary about his life and um, other stuff. In fact, our bio is huge today, which I'm about to dive into. And trust me when I say I cut it down as much as I could. Uh, it, It is it is his life is just a list of crazy stuff he did crazy places he went, um, you know, all the awards and programs and organizations he was a part of or founded um, or was awarded over the course of his life. It's absolutely mind-boggling how much happened We're going to try to not even dude. get into his personal life, which is a whole other Yeah, if you want to if you want to <laughs> uh, unlock his personal life, his it, it's actually probably best addressed in the life aquatic. Um, we have a biopic that we're going to talk about today. That's about Jacques Cousteau, but it's not very good. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to come very out there. surface. Yeah. It's very, it's very much like a photo album. Um, I am, not, well, yeah, we'll get into it. But I kind it, of imagine that film is what Jacques Cousteau like saw two hours before he died. Yeah, it was like his life <laughs> flashing before his eyes. Um, yeah, it, it, and at this, it it it, it manages to not be personal whatsoever, which is absolutely crazy. That they pulled it that might off. not even be know. about him, and I kind of want to bring that up when we get there. But we'll yeah, get there at no, the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of framed around his kid. Anyway, uh, so Jacques Cousteau was born in 1910 in Saint-André-de-Cubsat. I don't, I don't freaking know how to it's say that. It's been a while since we butchered uh, a language on the show. <laughs> but Except French, it's your turn Gaelic. today. Uh, <laughs> it's a commune in uh, southwestern France um, that he was born in. It now has like a street named the Rue des Commandants. Cousteau, um, because he was born there. Uh, And he started a a career in the Navy, eventually wanting, uh, originally wanting to become a pilot, uh, but he had an automobile accident where he broke both of his arms. And if you're not familiar with what it takes to be a pilot, you basically have to be like a perfect specimen to be like a military pilot, and broken arms kind of disqualifies you. Um, But after that, he uh, focused, refocused his passion on the ocean. Um, and in fact, you actually hear in some of his uh, documentaries and some of his interviews where he often talks about the experience of uh, scuba diving as being uh, as one of flying, uh, one of weightlessness. And you can definitely see how those two like passions of his are connected. Mm-hmm. Um, he did serve as a French intelligence officer in the 30s and 40s uh, and began experimenting very early on in his military career with underwater exploration, starting in 1936, where he started uh, diving or free diving, basically, because scuba diving wasn't a thing, uh, with something called Fernez goggles, which you would think, oh, that's just goggles. It's not. It's it's really it's like it looks like a gas mask for your face. Um, 
and it's it's a, like the earliest form of underwater explorative explorative goggles um, that eventually became the goggles that we know today. Um, after the fall of France in 1940, um, because France was actually defeated in World War II and was kind of broken apart, and part of it kept fighting, and part of it didn't. Uh, Cousteau uh, fled to a town in the southeast of France um, where he made friends with a mountain explorer named Marcel Icac. I, Icac? I, I don't actually know how to say that name at all. Um, and they kind of worked together to start developing breathing apparatuses. And they even had a friend of theirs, Leon Vecchet, uh, develop a, a depth pressure proof camera case. Uh, housing so they could film underwater um, and they shot their first underwater uh, film called 18 meters deep uh, off of the Imbias islands in the Mediterranean off the south coast of France um, which is the first underwater documentary that uh, Jacques Cousteau ever made I've watched it it's very interesting it's very grainy um, did you find it with subtitles because I didn't actually know what was going I did not on find but it I did with watch subtitles the either <laughs> I just watched the whole thing in French yeah um, and, you know, I'm really not there for the dialogue or the narration. I'm just yeah, there to see true. cool underwater shots. It's very, it is very interesting to watch. Um, in 1943, they made a movie called Epave, or Shipwrecks, um, which is actually featured in the biopic later on and is also widely available on YouTube and Vimeo, um, where they used uh, their prototype of the Aqualung, which is something that was designed by... Uh, both Jacques Cousteau and uh, his later collaborator, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, Louis Mallet, that's it. Uh, they, they designed it, they had an engineering firm build it, and they started using it with a pave and shipwrecks uh, to explore underwater. And that is actually what eventually became scuba gear. Um, and they added all sorts of to, uh, stuff to it, pressurization, regulation, um, kind of developing and tweaking it. And throughout his career, he kind of developed scuba more and more. And basically the gear that's used for modern day scuba is all developed by Jacques Cousteau's efforts. Um, but anyway, they made this film. Uh, it did really well in local competitions in France. Um, he, at the same time, he was helping to organize French resistance efforts uh, with the allies to drive Axis intelligence officers out of the South of France where he won several medals. And this is kind of the point in his life where we start getting into the, the situation where so much is happening. Um, and he's constantly like on the go, traveling, adventuring, saving France, uh, that it gets a little wild and it's hard to keep track of. Um, after showing his work to an admiral, uh, the French uh, Navy actually created an underwater research group um, and made him the head of it. Uh, and they spent a lot of time actually clearing mines out of the Mediterranean in the second half of the 1940s after World War II. They also spent a lot of time uh, diving and exploring more shipwrecks. That seems to be an early focus of his uh, career before he really got into marine biology. During this it comes time, into he, one of our movies too, though. It does. Uh, eventually, uh, during this time, he also rescued a French professor who was stuck in something called a bathysphere, which is a submarine which is really the first documented uh, interplay I've found with uh, Jacques Cousteau and submarines, which is a big part of his career as well. Um, he wrote all of his tales uh, of the 1940s, of which is quite a bit, a lifetime's worth, really, in a book called The Silent World, which would later became, uh, become the name of his first movie. He left the Navy in 1950 to found the French Oceanographic Campaigns. Uh, that's what they call it, although most people call it the FOC. Uh, and leased the Calypso for the first time, which is pretty much his home. Um, so <laughs> yeah. much so that even when he uh, divorces one of his wives, he had a few, uh, she basically just kept living on the boat uh, because they had spent so, like their family just spent so much time on it. Yeah. Uh, so actually, just I just want to point this out. The interesting thing is that he actually didn't divorce his first wife until she died of cancer and then he married one of his mistresses. But he did have two kids while he was still married to his first wife with the woman he would later marry. Like I said, his personal life is a mess. Well, he's French. <laughs> um, uh, uh, he continued to develop scuba technology and this is when he really starts, late 1940s, early 1950s, is when he starts to get interested in marine biology. Uh, he was doing stuff like he predicted the... Uh, the fact that dolphins can echolocate underwater. 
Um, and eventually a team of his scientists were the ones to prove that. Or porpoises, uh, if you ask uh, him. Porpoises, that was it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> in 1954, he made his first feature-length documentary uh, called The Silent World with his buddy Louis Mallet, and that won the Palme d'Or, um, which is kind of the beginning of his real, like like his film career, which was never really his main focus, um, but it was kind of how he brought his research and adventures to the public and also through his TV deals, how he made a lot of his money to continue doing this exploration. Uh, So after that, he ended up setting up a series of experimental underwater villages uh, called that were featured heavily in the world without sun. Uh, There was a big belief in all these futuristic ideas in the mid 20th century. People are like, Oh, we're going to live on the moon. We're going to live underwater. And this was one of those things. It mainly ended up being used for underwater research, um, and it was very helpful for that. Um, eventually, in the late 60s, he signed a deal for a television series called The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, which is the one that most people um, our parents' age uh, remember <laughs> from when they grew up. Uh, which I and, just realized was voiceovered by Rod Serling. So oh, that's fun. Well, that, that makes sense. He's got a good voiceover. I feel like Rod Serling is a good... American counterpart to Jacques Cousteau's like slow, methodical, soothing voice. Yes, you might play it these days to fall asleep on the water. And that actually, <laughs> uh, the the French. So if you're wondering, the uh, the narrative style in SpongeBob, that voice is based off of the French uh, narration in Jacques Cousteau's movies. That that is directly what it's pulled from. Yeah. Uh, so. Let's see. So he set up this this uh, this TV series that actually funded a lot of his uh, a lot of his adventures uh, because basically he would agree to film the adventure as entertainment and also he would be paid to carry out his science experiment or whatever. It probably blew up a few reefs. Um, and <laughs> that's all actually people. so the the TV series is actually where the red hat really comes from. It's standard. Uh, it was standard d- diving dress in his part of the world um, and was meant to be kind of a, a personal touch. Originally, it was meant to only be him who wore it. And then it just eventually became like a symbol of the crew. So everyone was wearing the same red hat. Um, in 1979, uh, his second son and apparently his favorite son, um, we, which he's pretty open about, uh, and his favorite successor who was... Uh, did a lot of collaboration with him. A little bit of a dental force streak. Yeah, everything since the 60s uh, forward, his son uh, collaborated with him on it, basically co-produced. Uh, and he was supposed to be the heir to the Calypso and this like navigation duty and empire that Casto built. Um, and he tragically died in a seaplane accident in Portugal. Uh, there was a bit of controversy surrounding it because it wasn't investigated very well. Uh, mm. and there is international and there's all these issues about it, but it was, it was very tragic. And that also kind of marks the end of his second series called the Odyssey of Cousteau. Uh, so after that, he, he still makes a few things, but not nearly as much. And in his old age, he starts to get a little mm, crazy. Uh, so at a certain point, there's a quote I found of him where he's ta- worried about overpopulation, which is legitimate from an ecological standpoint. But he's like, at this point, we need to have 350,000 people die a day. Um, it's like this big rambly quote. And he's like, I'm, I really don't want to have to say this, but more people need to die. And I'm like, ooh, this is, this is not great. Um, yeah. But anyway... In 1996, the Calypso itself was accidentally rammed and sunk in a port in Singapore. Um, it was later refloated, um, and I believe is still afloat to these days, although it don't... I think, I think someone's trying to turn it into a museum. Yeah, I think its adventuring days are done. It seems like something destined for a museum. Yeah. Um, and Cousteau himself passed away from a heart attack at the age of 87 in Paris. Um, and here's a little bonus for you. Uh, the little yellow submarine that you hear about in the Beatles and other places, yeah, that's a literally just Cousteau's submarine. And when they're talking about, in the, the song, the diving about, saucer, yes. Uh, and there's another image of another uh, Cousteau uh, submarine that looks even more like the one featured on the Beatles album. Uh, 
And when they talk about we all live in a yellow submarine, they're talking about his underwater villages. So, uh, yeah, very much in the 60s culture. Um, he wasn't super preoccupied with 60s culture himself, it seems, but he did have an influence on it, and he was connected to the world around him, uh, even though he didn't spend a lot of time interacting with culture itself, so much as just exploring the natural world uh, that existed in the mid-20th century. Uh, so that was kind of a good sweeping look at his life, uh, although I'm sure there was a lot more that happened. Uh, I was kind of cherry-picking from a big list of things he did. Um, but without further ado, Jonathan, what movies are we actually talking about from Jacques Cousteau? And then I think we have one that's just about Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. So we're looking at The Silent World from 1956, which, as Alex said, was his first feature-length documentary uh, directed by Jacques Cousteau and his collaborator at the time, uh, Louis Mal. And that film won the Palme d'Or, and it's actually the only documentary to win the Palme d'Or for a long time until 2004 when Michael Moore uh, took it for Fahrenheit 9-11. Uh, and then we'll be looking at World Without Sun from 1964, directed by Jacques Cousteau himself. And the last film we'll be looking at is Voyage to the Edge of the World from 1976. Uh, and that was directed by Jacques Cousteau, Philippe Cousteau, and Marsh uh, Marshal Flamme. And uh, that is kind of a very broad look where they go to the Antarctic. Um, and then the final film we'll be watching today is The Odyssey uh, or L'Odyssey uh, from 2016, directed by Jérôme Sal. And uh, that is a biopic from Europe about his life, um, just kind of in, as Alex has already alluded, like very broad strokes. All right, Jonathan, let's kick it off with The Silent World from 1956. Jason, take it away. The Silent World from 1956. Filmed over two years, The Silent World documents the travels of Cousteau and his team of divers as they travel the Mediterranean Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean aboard the Calypso. Along the way, they use revolutionary filming techniques to document lobster fishing, the dangers of the bends, marine reefs, pods of whales, dolphins, and more. Alex, okay, Jonathan, a ride so... on a sea turtle can be a lot of fun. I don't know why. I keep thinking about that line over and over again. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. I'm sure it is. I'm sure the turtle doesn't like it. Uh, there was so much riding of turtles. The sea turtles, the land turtles, all the turtles. So, so here's the thing with this movie. It's definitely not what I would call good scientific research. <laughs> it's really good exploration and adventure. You can tell that the um, that the rules. I mean, it's not even like they're breaking the rules because the rules just didn't they're, straight up didn't exist. Rules. Yeah, um, they're kind of out there, sort of pushing to establish them. And oh, they even though they don't even realize it. Um, they but, you establish know, eventually, them by doing them wrong, basically. By doing them wrong, yes. This is very true. Um, but it, in that in that process, I think that's one of the most interesting things here. There's a real sense of the unknown here. Like, yeah. There's almost, it feels like at times, like they're trying to pass it off, like this is what we always do out here on the ocean. And I'm like, sure, maybe that's what you always do, but this is all definitely new you're really breaking new ground here this is a mm -hmm. lot of pioneering there's this true sense of adventure um and is really captivating to watch and i can totally see how this uh this movie helps kind of inspire a generation of marine biologists um yeah now of course we do have to mention there's a lot of not good stuff in Let's this. just go down the laundry list, okay, Alex? There's a there's a laundry list. Um, so uh, the we'll we'll start with the biggest one because it's kind of like a series of events. Uh, so they they follow a pod of whales. Uh, yeah, and they're like chasing this pod of well, whales. Well, maybe before we get into that, because that's that's a big thing. Um, but let's just let's just touch on the dynamite first of all. Okay, the dynamite's a problem. Uh, so this is passed off as a scientific procedure in which they want to count how many fish are in a reef. Um, and I don't know, instead of like, I don't know, taking a picture or dropping nets and counting how many fish are in like a square Out of area. Out a sample, yeah. 
uh, they they're like the only way to keep the fish still is to murder them all with dynamite. <laughs> so they 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 throw a stick of dynamite in the water. And if you don't know, uh, dynamite fishing is very illegal everywhere because it yeah. kills everything in the black. A lot of radius. places you're not even allowed to throw fireworks in the water. Yeah, it's it's a seri- it's a, it's a, it's seriously devastating. It destroys a lot of reef, um, which we now know is a big problem. Uh, not that takes Jacques hundreds Cousteau's, of like, years single, to regrow. Yeah, not that Jacques Cousteau is single handedly responsible for the reef issue in the world. In fact, he's probably done much more to help it than right. he's blown up. But he has blown up quite a bit of reef uh, to count fish, and it's kind of like the rough. Uh, layman's approach to counting fish that's very 1950 ish ish it's mm-hmm. it it just screams people thought this was a good idea in the 1950s but also how did anyone think this was a good idea in the 1950s at any uh, time yeah yeah it, it's 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 a mess it's a mess so that's that's a big one that happens i will uh, say that, that that sequence has a shot in it that kind of illustrates something that's that's also interesting about this movie because this is the most destructive of the movies we're talking about oh yeah Um, it gets way better moving forward it's all presented in like this weird uh like curious nonchalant way um where he just describes what's happening and he doesn't seem to have like a real connection to how terrible it is or you know as we're about to talk about in the next incident like how much he is causing all the terrible things uh, mm-hmm. and so there's like a shot at the end of the dynamite sequence where they pull up a bunch of fish. Um, and after he, you know, calmly talks about, we must, uh, document them quickly because their color fades as they die. And you're just like, Oh, okay. Uh, and then there's like a shot of a puffer fish and, you know, puffer fish f- inflate with water under the water and they've brought it on land and it just like deflates is like a solid 20, 30 seconds of just watching this puffer fish deflate and it's really sad and pathetic looking. And mm-hmm. we just watch it. We just watch it deflate. Yep. It's it's real sad. There's definitely like this this fascination there in the way this this documentary is made and cut and what they choose to show. Um but there's also It's almost a naivete. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of like it feels like children running around with dynamite. Um, I was gonna say a lot of it's, it's almost like like a like a group of frat boys went out and just just like wreaked havoc. But also, I mean, kind that's of hundred percent what it is. It's like a bunch down. of yeah. It's like a bunch of um, free willing French guys, most of whom have served in the military at some point. Yeah, uh, just kind of running off and doing their thing. Uh, with absolutely no no concern at this point with ha- what their effect on the world is. Yeah, no accountability or supervision be. at this point, because yeah. this is the very yeah. beginning. Yeah, All eventually right, so now they become uh, aware of themselves. And in the future films, they're much more scientific, they're much less destructive. Mm-hmm. But we do have to talk about the whale and shark incident. The whale, yeah. The um, whales. So the they're cha- they, at a certain point, they catch sight of a pot of whales. Uh, it's really choose, cool to watch that, first of it all. It is, it is. But they chase the whales, and at some point they end up running over a baby whale, um, which is a hundred percent their fault. Like it's not like, "Oops, the whale decided to go under us." No, you're chasing the whales. Right. Um, so they run over the baby whale, and so uh, remind me, Jonathan, do they decide to put the whale out of its misery? I think that's something. Yeah, they, they do. do. So the yeah. the the propellers chop up the whale. And we watch it flounder around. It can't get back to the pod. Then they harpoon it and shoot it in the head to take it to out of its misery. Put it out of its misery after they ran yeah. it over. And, and he talks then, about it like it's such a sad event. Like he didn't just run over this baby whale yeah, himself. Yeah, they, they they really try to pass it off like they didn't cause this thing to happen. Uh, and they're they're not guilty about it at we all. We just watched it happen, though. And of course, so you've just killed a very large animal in the water. And what do you think happens? Sharks show up. Um, and then they go into this segment where uh, they the talk about line. how <laughs> the, uh, the natural enemy of the sea explorer is the shark. We have an unbound hatred for them. Yep. They pr- then proceed to hook all of the sharks that they can out of the water, throw them onto the deck of the boat, and then they just take hammers 
and beat the sharks to death. It is yeah. one of the most shocking, reprehensible, crazy things I've ever seen. Uh, it, it's just, it's absolutely absurd. It's the lowest point that I've seen in Jacques Cousteau's work. In any of these, yeah. It's it's really bad. It's really, 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 really bad. Uh, thankfully, they move forward. Eventually, Jacques Cousteau actually kind of develops like this respect for sharks and understands that they're important to the environment, um, that they just they are a part of the food chain. Um, I will say the other thing about that that's like the most mid 1950s is watching these crew members hook sharks, bring them on deck and club them without at any time dropping the cigarette out of their mouths. (laughs) (laughs) They really do. It's such it's such a like sample of like 1950s uh, Western bravado. It's 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 met. It's messy. It's bad. It's kind of disgusting. It's not great. Mm. It's really not good. Uh, but this movie does have a lot going for it. Like there is some really fascinating stuff. They do do an exploration of a shipwreck and you get to see all the like nooks and crannies. This is also we should point out one of the first times that any kind of undersea exploration was filmed and filmed in color. And these these uh, little things that they invented with the uh, propellers on them that they can kind of hold on. They look like torpedoes that the the divers can hold on to and kind of use like underwater motorcycles almost. And they mm-hmm. have cameras in them, which lets them get super, super cool shots, like swimming through a pod of dolphins right next to them. And I imagine this is stuff that, you know, nobody has ever seen this before. Like it's almost... Almost like Lumiere Brothers with the where they just show the train and that blows people's minds. But like you're seeing things under the water that most people will never get to see. Yeah, no, it is an absolutely like you totally understand the, the sense of adventure in it and why it's so exciting and why it's so interesting. Um, and you totally like at the end of it, you're kind of like, I want to go out on the ocean. This sounds fun. Um, or I don't want to like, I never want to go out on the ocean, <laughs> or <laughs> depending that. on your personality or that for sure. For sure. Uh, there definitely is. Um, I don't know. It's hard. It's definitely one of the things that just feels like, oh, you, it, it's so tempting to say, oh, it's a different time. But yeah. also maybe don't club wildlife to death. That's never like a good, yeah. good idea. You know, even if it's predatory wildlife, like it's just surviving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just it's just doing what it does. Uh, sharks don't randomly attack divers. That's yeah. not really a thing. In fact, you can go diving with sharks, like for fun. Uh, it just Alex, is a thing. Um, let's let's also talk about the other like interestingly disconnected point of the film, which is one of the very first things um, about the diver who who like almost gets the bends. Oh yeah 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 yeah. And then they, so this diver goes down and we, he explains the bends, which is actually really scary. I've never like been deep sea diving or anything, but the whole oh, idea the is bends, the, the bends will kill you. The yeah, the pressure, the pressure like messes with the, the nitrogen oxygen content in your blood and stuff. It basically like turns your blood into little champagne bubbles and stuff, which is terrifying. Yeah. So you have but to be messes really with careful your head. how fast yeah. you come up. Uh, and a side effect of that is you have to leave for the surface way ahead of when yeah. your air is going to give out. Because if you don't, then uh, you have to go up too fast uh, and you might get the bends. Uh, and you're not thinking straight. Can kill so you. This, yeah, you get real loopy. So this guy comes up and he's he's waited too long. And so they've got to put him in this pressurized cabin, like this little tiny tube that bar- he barely fits into. First of all, all these guys are so skinny. Um, just from their very active lives. But he gets in this tiny little claustrophobic tube where they can increase the pressure and release, you know, get him back to a normal state. And then, like, as soon as they get him in there, they're like, all right, you're going to be in there for three hours. Oh, lunch is ready. And they just ditch him, and some guy comes back and sits on him to to monitor him while he's eating the the lobster that they were just diving for is is kind of hilarious and then also they never show him coming out again so i just like to imagine that he's still there in that tube somewhere (laughs) to this day he's still in the tube um yeah it's 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 definitely dangerous i like that they opened up with that it's it's so close to the start of the uh 
of the documentary because uh, it does show you how um, how dangerous what they're doing really is. And in one of the later uh, documentaries, someone like straight up dies. Um, yeah, definitely not the only person to die on a Jacques Cousteau expedition either. Like they're doing some groundbreaking pioneering stuff. They're at the edge of the comfortably explorable world in, in like everything that they do here. Um, yeah. Which is really cool and really neat. And you can see how inspiring this is. Of course, at the same time, uh, the some of the content and values presented it, it, it are just reprehensible. Uh, now, of course, thankfully, Jacques Cousteau and his crew grow. It's not like they go around clubbing sharks. And by the time we get to the next movie, it's much more scientific. Um, yeah. So with that, Jonathan, do you want to move on to A World Without Sun? Yeah, let's do it. Jason, set us up. World Without Sun from 1964. Chronicling the experimental Continental Shelf Station 2, a.k.a. Con Shelf 2, World Without Sun documents a variety of early tests in underwater living and study. The film debuts Cousteau's iconic diving saucer submarine, exploring the effects of living in high pressure and the benefits of studying marine life in an underwater sea environment. 20,000 leagues below the sea. Um, There's so much Jules Verne that we can bring into this episode. This one, this one is deeply futurist. This, yeah. uh, this, this movie is really cool. It's super futuristic, but in the in this 20th century kind of way, in a lot of ways, like Jonathan's been saying, in a Jules Verne like 19th century way. It's like this is the idea of what the future could be. Yeah. Um, living except in they're this like underwater making it base. Yeah, like living in this underwater base, uh, taking these uh, expeditions deeper and deeper underwater to uh, essentially gather science. Now, of course, uh, a lot gathering of the impetus, science. gathering science, uh, a lot of uh, the impetus behind what they're doing is actually trying to develop um, a way to create underwater sell- settlements. Uh, where you actually have people live underwater. That didn't really become a thing. Uh, in fact, there's only one functional underwater base uh, currently located on the globe. Um, and it is, I believe, off. it's owned by a university in America. I think it's either in California or Florida, which would make a lot of sense either way. And it's, it's not very far down. Um, it's just far enough to be underwater. Uh, and it's used for science. And that's essentially what this experiment became. But the idea behind it, and uh, a lot of the narration veers towards this as well, is uh, getting excited about the opportunities that this kind of technology and this kind of pioneering and exploration could bring, which, again, is really cool. A lot of what's really cool about Jacques Cousteau is the ground he broke and the people he inspired to continue research and continue all of the scientific development around biology and nautical exploration. Yeah. Although I do kind of want to point out that, especially in this film, you, you kind of get a sense that there, there's so much more focus on the methods than the results. And that might just be because it's for a really like broad audience. They're trying to make it uh, appeal to people and stuff like that. But um, one of the things that I kind of took away after the film is there's there's a lot of kind of explanation of how there's there's basically three different levels and they draw they draw a handy little map at the beginning. There's the the yellow base at the top. There's one a few meters further down that's like a high pressure cabin where basically like two guys can barely like move and sleep and eat and stuff. Um, and so they use that as an experiment to see how they uh, can deal underwater, how they are like in pressure, what kind of like air mixture they have to do to keep them, you know, breathing right and all that kind of stuff. And then a little further down, they have some shark cages where they can do experiments and stuff. Um, But in the, in the high pressure cabin, they talk a lot about, you know, they're going down there. They're going to uh, live like that. They, you know, the helium that they induced into the air makes their voices all high, which was a fun kind of bit and stuff. But we never like we never come back to it and say what we discovered was that, you know, we can live down there or it's actually a really bad idea to do that. Here's what happened to the guys, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's just none of that. It's just like, here's here's how we're testing this. 
and then we kind of move on to other things. So I think it's interesting and just kind of reveals some of what the focus of these movies are is just presenting a lot of different things. Like we're, we're coming up with a lot of ideas, which is cool, but it's, it's not really an instructional film, if that makes sense. No, 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 no. This is very much just showing like what they're working on now. And it almost feels like a, like a, presentation to try to get more funding in a lot of ways yeah it's, does that it's, make sense like it's showing what like they're working on now deck. why it's exciting and why you, we should keep doing this which is honestly a bit, big reason why Jacques Cousteau made made these movies um yeah. is to keep people excited about this you know his goal was to inspire people to continue doing this and to keep paying him to let him keep doing <laughs> this as well um yeah. which you know mission accomplished and this film does introduce the yellow submarine and that first sequence of the the diving saucer. So, yeah, this film, like Alex said, is is going full futurism. And they they kind of like put the whole thing in that bubble by calling their submarine the diving saucer. So it looks like a sci fi UFO. They call the guys living down there. Um, uh, oh, gosh. What are they called? Oceanauts instead of astronauts. Um, so they're like leaning into this because this is the this space very age, 1960s. all that stuff. Um, very which 1960s. I love that that classic yeah. sci-fi crap. So this was great, but we, the, that sequence of the diving saucer going under the base and coming up, and you see the you know that it's it's basically like you take a bowl and you put it um, under the the water in the sink or something like that, and so the bowl has air in it, and that's basically how the whole station is. So they just leave the bottom open and they can swim up through the bottom and swim out to the different ones. Like, that's so cool to watch. The air yeah. doesn't come out unless you tilt the bowl. Yeah. Um, and other other ideas like that, which are super cool. Um, yeah, no, and I yet, mean, sometimes uh, what, we forget so, with, the, uh, with the, the way the 60s ended in all this pessimism and cynicism and skepticism that led into the 70s that it, it started as like, this very optimistic, hopeful time where we were like, oh, technology is going to make everything better. It's going to make everything great. And there's a lot of that attitude and hope and uh, technological optimism built into this movie. Yeah. And we, we found this film on YouTube and I'll have links to it in the blog post and all that. Um, and this is the last time I'll bring this up. But again, product of its time. One of the first comments in YouTube is there are six guys living in a tin can underwater and they're all smoking. <laughs> Like this they is are still the era that it's, we're living in, which is incredibly dangerous. It's so bad, um, yeah, and and I mean definitely not healthy, um, and probably I would, you know, you would think that people with people obsessed with uh, breathing properly in certain situations that they would be more they would just attentive not smoke to the in effect general. of smoking on your lungs. Yeah, but hey, man, they did your, say the one of the guys in the high pressure cabin who were like. And here's whatever his name is, uh, Michel, and he has to go down. He is a heavy smoker. He will have to give it up for two weeks while he's down there. I'm like, but you're sm- you're still in a little cabin smoking. Like, how is that different? It's not a good look. It's very 1960s, though. Um, a bunch of people very addicted to nicotine. Yeah. So, Alex, the the another thing that's interesting about this film is the uh, they they're getting better. So they're they're learning about you know not killing the fish but in this film they are still putting the fish in plastic baggies and shipping them to museums they uh, are they are and they're they finding, still have they're this finding weird, this stuff <laughs> and they have like this weird morbid scene where they've captured the fish in the little finding nemo bags and they're they're on strings so they're like little balloons tied to the ocean floor they don't bring them into their research station they just leave them out there as long as they're captured and then they just watch these big fish come and like oh, the attack the bags. Yeah, the well, not the barracudas, but just bigger fish trying to like eat at the fish that are stuck in the bags. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like that's traumatizing for the little fish. Uh, but also, they just like straight up fed one of them to an eel because they thought it would be a cool shot. Because um, they also have some in these little like plastic boxes uh, and stuff like that. But I also imagine that this kind of stuff, like this diving and finding new fish and then shipping them to museums and zoos and aquariums and stuff like that. Uh, I, I haven't found anything specifically about this, but I imagine that kind of increased the popularity of things like aquariums and, and 
what kinds of things can be seen there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And we still have very exotic fish located in aquariums. Um, probably, I mean, you can literally see the process of cataloging and discovering fish in this movie. You can yeah. see the process where they kind of have developed some techniques for um, for capturing fish. And, and that was one of the them. advantages of having this the station under the water was that they could pull up uh, fish and urchins and stuff like that and study them before they had kind of dried out and died by bringing them up or had taken them out of their environment. So they could study them more naturally uh, and then release them. They don't really say that, but I'm going to say they release them afterwards <laughs> so uh, they can. <laughs> yeah, at least some of them in this one they're kind them. enough to keep the uh, the murder off screen this time yeah yeah i think yeah once they put that first one out and they had eyes on it uh they were like oh we we have to pay attention to who else is going to be watching these yeah yeah it is uh it it's a really cool one this one actually feels like they've kind of i, I like that every time we come back to the jacques Cousteau world it feels like they've gotten better at what they do yeah um, they've gotten a little more humane at what they do um, and more scientific about it as well. Like you can feel the growth there between this movie and the movie that came out almost 10 years before it. Um, and that's really nice. There's no shark clubbing in this one. Good progress. No shark clubbing. And I think this film also brings a lot of kind of, uh, cinematic innovations to it as well. Like there's, there's a pretty famous shot looking through the porthole in the station and then pulling out to reveal the ocean until, the window is just like kind of a speck of light in the ocean. This is described specifically in the Odyssey, which we'll get to. But it is it is something that, you know, some of the critics at the time were saying that shot must have been faked in a studio like they're they're doing this. But Jacques Cousteau defended it and like explained how they had this pulley system so that they could, you know, reverse the camera and all this kind of stuff. So they did a lot of really cool stuff. This is the first I think the first film that uh, his son Philippe started helping with and started to kind of bring more of a cinematic eye to the way that these are are shot and filmed and stuff like that. And it's it shows that there's some really cool shots in this. Oh, yeah, yeah. For well, sure. I will say that the nighttime sequence kind of uh, made me sleepy. I was watching it late and it's just a lot of really dark cinematography is like Jacques Cousteau's soothing voice. Um, but it was really cool to watch, but it does make you a little drowsy. Yeah, it definitely has that Bob Ross effect, right? Like he's got this, like the the soothing voice is definitely there. Like the slow pace of underwater is definitely there. Like you feel like you're slipping beneath the waves and just kind of falling asleep at the same time. You can um, see where like James Cameron gets his fascination for this kind of stuff that he yeah, takes to I mean, like he's, extreme he's exactly, levels. Exactly the generation that is inspired by this exact kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is super cool. Um, all right, Jonathan, do you want to move on to Voyage to the Edge of the World? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get frosty. Jason, take it away. Voyage to the Edge of the World from 1976. The film follows the adventure of Cousteau and his crew once again aboard the Calypso on a four-month expedition through Antarctica. Collecting footage from the ship, the shore, the diving saucer, and even a hot air balloon, Cousteau shows never-before-filmed sights of penguins, seals, and icebergs from a variety of perspectives accompanied by his customary narrative style. All right, Jonathan, uh, would you go on an expedition to Antarctica? No, Alex, I'm too much of a Texas boy. I was just, I was freezing just watching this movie. Yeah, yeah, that, um... It's a it's pretty frosty up there. Looks pretty cold. Looks I very get, like, dangerous. Every time someone wasn't wearing gloves or like something over their face, I was like, how are you surviving? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like how are you uh how are you still uh still alive right now? It it was an incredibly dangerous journey. This was easily the most dangerous video. They almost uh, didn't make it out at all. Oh yeah, they came really close to dying. It's actually one of the best parts of the uh, biopic too. <laughs> is uh, a yeah, they know, almost right? die. It, it's also cool. Like these three films have such a scope. Like they're so such different in their topics, their locations and all that kind of stuff. So this is, I think this is one of the first times that glaciers were ever filmed under the water. Uh, and towards the end of this film, they have some incredible sequence of just like spelunking into a glacier and the just mesmerizing 
visuals of the ice acting like a hall of mirrors and the the interesting like textures and patterns uh, that go along with that is so cool to watch. And then also, it, and like you're saying, like the dangers of having the Calypso, this little like rinky dink uh, old minesweeper that has already been, I mean, this is towards the end of Cousteau's career and uh, this is in the seventies. And so this ship has been through a lot already with him, not to mention oh, it's yeah. war days and it's like almost falling apart by the end of the movie uh, and getting stranded and they're like pushing icebergs out of the way so that it can get through. They even mentioned Shackleton, uh, in the movie and you're just like, what is happening right now? This is crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the things they do mention in the Odyssey that, uh, you learn about with this movie. They didn't ha- they only had so much money and they couldn't afford an icebreaker and the uh, Calypso is not really meant for this. Nope. At all. Uh, so yeah, this like is the little minesweeper that could. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the edgy edgy adventure. This is uh, Jacques Cousteau having a bunch of confidence after a half a century of success. Half a, cen- a century well, plus of success. The, if the biopic is to believe too, it's him desperate for more money because he's starting to lose funding at this point. Oh yes, yeah, that too, um, which thankfully does not really leak over into the production. I also like in this one that no, we, it still get looks a, great. It, we get a more mature Custo. Um, I mean, he was, he, he's like 66 in this movie. Um, he seems much wiser in this one. He seems to care much more about the wildlife um, yeah. than he did before. And I see, he, you can, and, and the, the, the love that he shows to like the, ex, the exploration and the world he's discovering and the nature as it is intact is really cool. Yeah. But the, there is a bit of a like interesting paradox in that after watching uh, the uh, the silent world, you I, I can't help but think like, is he just putting on a face for the audience or, you know, but I think at this point he definitely is feeling that. But, you know, World Without Sun, I was like, they're like really trying hard not to show themselves clubbing sharks, aren't they? Yeah, I think I think they I think they learned. I think he it, after more and more exploration, he learned and learned mm-hmm. more and more. He and had started I, doing conservation at this point, too, I think. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He I mean, he'd fought a bunch. There's a lot of mentions in uh, biographies I can find on him and bi- biographical summaries. That's mentioned all of the uh, ecological efforts he's gone into things to stop pollution, um, things to keep uh, animals from being hunted to extinction, all, all sorts of stuff that uh, he kind of got involved in over the years. But again, a lot of that stuff didn't really exist uh, yeah. before a certain time. I mean, actually, so this is more personal, but one of the more interesting sites in L.A. is actually the old L.A. Zoo, uh, which is located right next to the new L.A. Zoo. Uh, but if you look <laughs> at the old L.A. Zoo, it's been turned into a park. And if you look at the uh, the places where the animals are kept, they're they're straight up just tiny cages uh there, yeah. there's not like there's like not even grass in there some of them don't even have like a ground they just have cage um and people are mm-hmm. like oh why did the zoo, zoo shut down well it treated animals like crap so it literally just kept them in small cages so yeah you know it it definitely was a thing that kind of had to be learned and developed that that emotional learning that kind of happened almost as a species which is pretty interesting and people like Jacques Cousteau played a big a big role in it um, and kind of paved the way for later conservationists. Yeah. Yeah. And again, some of the stuff that they're able to capture in this film is incredible. Like they brought, this one is cool too, because it feels, it feels like a summation of everything that Jacques Cousteau has done. So they have a hot air balloon on there again, getting the Jules Verne vibes. Um, They bring the diving saucer uh, on the Calypso to go under the water and all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, shots of penguins, shots of seals and whales and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. No, the, the cinematography in this movie is amazing. Um, the exploration is incredible. You can tell this paved, paved the way for a lot of um, stuff kind of like, oh, gosh, what are they called? Blue Planet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the nature documentaries, all the nature photography. 
I definitely uh, want to talk about that in in overall which is too. Super cool. Everything that came out of Nat Geo uh, later on. Nat Geo um, Discovery Channel now. Discovery Channel, all all that super cool stuff. It also kind of paves the way for like danger reality television, where they just like chuck people out into the wild like naked, uh, <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, let's see if you survive. It'll be a yeah. cool adventure. Um, kind of also comes from this vein in a certain way. Of course, um, I would say Jacques Cousteau is being more careful. He definitely has more experience. But Jacques Cousteau is also just reckless enough to be interesting. Right, right. Again, as shown by like the propellers of the ship breaking as they come out. Um, one And as we should mention, one of the crew actually died on this expedition. Not like through... It doesn't seem like it's through any careless... Uh, you know, exploring of icebergs or anything. Uh, he actually got hit by one of the propellers on their helicopter. Um, they don't really explain how that happened, but no, no, it's kind of it, very. It vague. is a. Uh, they do make like a whole emotional thing out of it, and they leave some of the guys there to uh, keep exploring while Cousteau heads back to bring the body back to the family. Um, there's also a, another emotional sequence where again kind of playing on the whole uh conservation thing where they they kind of have this almost sappy sequence about the whalers um as they get to antarctica and they're like there's there's no whales and then they they put together this huge like whale skeleton which was really cool to see um but and then they talk about how the the whalers had come and um because i mean that was a huge problem for centuries i think it's still a problem i'm not caught up on my uh ecology um uh what whaling (laughs) yeah japan yeah what not quite as Uh, universal as it as it has been in the past but it's still a huge thing there's pretty severe anti-whaling laws that are actually held up internationally um some countries kind of flaunt it um japan um sorry i didn't i'm not calling anyone out but it's probably japan um who keeps whaling um, except they don't do it officially. They just ignore their people who do it and continue it's not to, enforced. Yeah. They, yeah. They, it's just not enforced basically. So, uh, it, it, it's really not like a huge scale problem anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it definitely does still happen. It's considered illegal in most places. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah, know all but the they do details. Have that, they do have that sequence where they, you know, they talk about how big a problem whaling was and they show the, whale skeleton and stuff i think that was the the most the sequence that was the most like in i guess today's parlance like virtue signaling like they're showing look we know whaling is bad look at us that kind of thing <laughs> we don't run over whales anymore yeah right um, they, they they grew good for them also the last film to feature Cousteau's son mm-hmm. um because of his plane accident uh but it is it is a good one for me. For me, uh, looking at the Custo canon, this is kind of like the end of the peak Custo. He does do more work after this. I watched Journey of the Saint Lawrence, Stairway to the Sea, which is interesting, but it doesn't have the same character. Um, at that point, is it kind of like Custo is is like an icon, and he's kind of yeah, being used to bolster yeah, other projects? Yeah, basically, basically. Yeah, that's what it seems it's still like. it's still the Calypso. Um, but he doesn't really seem as interested in the, the movie at all. I'm sure he's still interested in the, the research and the journey. Uh, but I don't think that he, he just seems checked out of the uh, the production at that point. Which, to be fair, he's pretty freaking old at that point. He's in <laughs> yeah. his, by the time, uh, I mean, he was in his 60s for Voyage. And uh, by the time St. Lawrence and uh, the sequel, which is great lakes depths unknown i think it's called is um in his 80s so he's he's pretty old uh yeah. and you know i i can only you can only expect so much from an 80 year old man who spent his entire life adventuring on boats and clearing out out mines um you know it, it's it's uh it's acceptable it, it's definitely a very good stretch of adventure that he's documented and he put so much effort into the movies for the time that he did that it is um uh it, it's quite impressive it's just it's a really cool body of work i really recommend it 
especially if you it, even if you just want something to throw on while you work like the 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 tv shows are really good uh, yeah. go check out the movies they're super cool maybe don't watch all of silent world if you don't want to see sharks <laughs> club to death uh, <laughs> but like but, i said it has some really cool elements yeah it's got some really cool elements too uh, so yeah so that's that's all of the uh Cousteau documentaries we're going to talk about for today uh but let's talk about a Cousteau biopic the odyssey from 2016 jason take it away the odyssey from 2016 The Odyssey examines the adult life of Jacques Cousteau from the beginning of his film career and follows his rise to notoriety, contrasted against his turbulent relationship with his second son, Philippe, until Philippe's untimely death in the years following the release of their final collaboration, Voyage to the Edge of the World. All right, so Jonathan, this is technically a movie. Uh, It's more more of like a highlight reel is what it feels like. I, I, I felt that same way too. Like it doesn't... It doesn't really have anything to say about Jacques Cousteau. It kind of just no. goes through a lot of the things that happened to him. And honestly, I I would almost say that it's more of a biopic of Philippe Cousteau than anything else. Like, oh, he has a much more interesting storyline. He, I mean, the the film is bookended with him, so we actually see Philippe Cousteau's entire life in this biopic. We start with Jacques Cousteau after he's married, has his two kids, after his war years, and we kind of focus on some of his adventures. But I don't think there's hardly any of Jacques Cousteau's life that we see apart out of uh, Philippe's lens, except maybe some of the stuff with his wife. But we see, like, we skip over a huge chunk of time of Cousteau's life through a montage of newspaper clippings in Philippe Cousteau's dorm room at his boarding school. Uh, and he's like hanging up all the things that his dad is doing. And so we skip over like the silent world years, um, the, the um, world without sun years. I think the only movie we really see the production of is, uh, well, we see, we see a pave, we see like the really early stuff. And then yeah, we yeah, see yeah. Um, voyage to the uh, edge of the world. Yeah, that's that's where the focus of the film kind of comes to. Um, and then it's kind of a process of getting there. And we mostly see sort of Jacques Cousteau as a uh, figure getting deals and um, and that building kind of an stuff. Empire. Building an empire and then his and then like just kind of seasoned with all of his personal troubles with his wife and, and stuff like that as that's happening. But there's not enough focus on like his film work there's not really enough focus on his personal life uh i really think the only thing that we have a fairly complete picture of is philippe cousteau and i guess there's some of like there's actually a lot of time spent on jacques cousteau's relationship with the oil people that's actually like a huge part of the they spent a long time on that yeah i almost feel like the more interesting half of of jacques cousteau's life is everything that comes before it like all the stuff we haven't seen yeah. on film like how did he become that guy there's you no know, origin story he element. started off as like a kid obsessed with flight and the ocean and then he served in a war and he had that accident that changed the course of his life you know all of that actually could make for a pretty interesting story uh developing the aqua lung while basically hiding out in the south of france from the nazis um his brother who was a nazi and was sentenced to death he didn't actually die his sentence was commuted um, but you know, the first half of his life is actually really fascinating. We already know about the second half. Yeah. Right. Um, that, and, that and half was public. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the worst part is that there's no driving force behind Jacques Cousteau for like, he wants to do things. Sure. But we don't have like a concentrated theme or effort or we, we don't really have an idea of who he is as a person. Um, they, not I mean, that's they, not well acted. It's just that there's not like a lot to work with within the script as they chose it's it's like it's played like super duper safe like yeah i mean even the person so the, they touch on the personal stuff because we see like his wife get you know more and more depressed as she goes into drinking and smoking and stuff after she realizes that he's a serial adulterer um he's and french. yeah and yet he's you know he never Man, divorces her french today yeah uh And so we see that and yet it's never like fully condemned within the movie. Like every time Jacques Cousteau talks about it, he's like, yeah, that's just how I live. Like they don't really talk about 
any of that. We just see the effect of it on his wife. And um, it's kind of contrasted with Philippe Cousteau, who it's kind of shown has a pretty solid relationship um, throughout his life. I didn't look up to see how accurate that is. That might have been uh, my watch. Towards the end, it got a little rough. He tried to um, he tried to start a resort in Florida using the Cousteau name, and his father was not happy about that. So there was. I think that was the there. other one. I think that was Jean Jean Michel. Oh, sorry. There you go. It's that one. Um, Jean Michel is the one who's presented in in this film as like the the stiff business son who I think he's the older one. That yeah, he's was the not, first son, not who's the preferred not, son. Who's 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 not dad's favorite. <laughs> yeah, he's so he's so upfront about that. He's so insultingly rude. He's so French. But it does seem like the first son is like trying to is almost more sympathetic to the dad than Philippe was because Philippe is always upset about his dad wandering around, like philandering, losing money, all this kind of stuff. Whereas the other son is like, I'm going to help, you know, fund underwater housing and stuff like that, which is all the stuff that his dad was doing. But his dad's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And then that, yeah. that kind of fails. And so then he just becomes part of the Calypso crew. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's um, his personal life was not great. Yeah. That's basically the gist of what I got from this. Uh, That's yeah, kind of movie. how the movie is. And then like, but but like I said, like it God, starts it with has, Philippe no, as a little boy, and it ends with Philippe's death. It actually starts with Philippe's death too. But it has um, no excuse to be this freaking boring. <laughs> so yeah, and it's not boring. like it's badly produced. Like we've talked about bad movies, but this is just like a really bland. It's so kind of a yeah. It's thing. it's bland. It's wheat bread. It's um. I will say, that, like, it, no it helps to kind of frame his life. So as an academic watch, it's interesting. I think it hits a lot of points that actually happened. The film starts with a thing that it has to, which I think even Life Aquatic does with, like, a statement of this film was produced with zero input from the Cousteau Society uh, and no support from them. So they put that disclaimer at the beginning. But then I think, you know, it especially after watching Cousteau's films and kind of learning some about him it's just it's interesting to see all that in like a timeline and you kind of get a point of references for various things that happened in his life but as a film it doesn't have a driver it doesn't really have a, an arc it, it's it's missing like an extra layer that make that would make it a good movie yeah there's no real interest generated here it's very it's very blah it's very blah it's 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 one of the symptoms that I think kind of happens a lot with these um because this is I didn't look it up, but I'm hundred percent sure this is a grant film. This is a European grant film. Uh, and it's kind of one of the problems that plagues those every once in a while, where they just they don't have a driving force. Like they're there's 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 so it's such a free production style that there's almost no pressure to make it interesting. Like they don't have to fight for anything. They already have the money. They can just make it. Um, yeah. They don't have to fight for a new grant because they'll probably get it anyway. So they just, it, yeah. it, it just it, it's ends a, up being kind of bland. It's a safe call either way. I mean, aside from, I guess, taking off yeah, the Cousteau Society of, potentially. Overly but, safe. Yeah, I mean that's what I'm saying though. Like it's it's easy yeah. to have this movie get made because it's about an an interesting person who hero. enough people yeah. know about. Yeah, and that you know they're they're gonna make their money back. So you know why not make this movie basically and not like why should we make this movie? I wish they had just tried something interesting. There there are so many angles you could have gone with this. You know, like there there are so many nuances of Cousteau's life that instead of just like gl glancing over all of them, you just pick one and just dive into it. Like really show how his marriage falls apart, how his wife feels being on his boat while he's like, so like, you know, the, the cliche of the, the sailor, you know, with a girl in every port or whatever, doesn't mm -hmm. even really hold up here because his wife lived on his boat. Like she was there all the time. <laughs> Like yeah. that, that would have been an interesting angle. The angle yeah. uh, with his son, which is kind of the one that it takes, is still not the focus. The angle of, you know, what happens. 
even the angle of, you know, going from a shark clubber to a conservationist would have been an interesting angle, but none of those are really focused in on. Well, it's funny that we, we mention all the, the these problems with the Odyssey, because examining those and looking at what uh, the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou does well, the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou is a better biopic. <laughs> like, it just, it's, it's, it's even more made up. But that kind of even fits with the trend of Jacques Cousteau's life um, of being fantastical and otherworldly. And, oh, you have to see it to believe it. Uh, yeah. If you want a better depiction, and, and now that I know more about, like, his son um, and his wife and everything, I'm like, oh, I actually see that now in The Life Aquatic. Like, mm-hmm. those are actually which, plot points there. Which is fits perfectly with Wes Anderson's whole kind of oeuvre, which is creating movies that are quirky and fun. Yeah. 1960s color palette just in general. And, uh, but also having like really deep, um, deep cut, like family stuff going underneath some of the fun and quirky stuff. And we talked about all that kind of stuff that goes into Wes Anderson a long time ago. Um, but you can see how he's a perfect fit to tell this kind of a story because Jacques Cousteau was this quirky, fun, kind of uh, personality on the surface who had a lot of other things going on beneath the surface. No pun intended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's a bummer. This, this movie's a bummer. (laughs) I wish they had done something interesting. Yeah. Because he's an interesting guy. I still think it makes sense to go along with, with some of these films, but uh, overall it, it, it could have brought a lot more to the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because honestly, I think the maybe the most interesting th- thing to me about Jacques Cousteau when it comes to talking like the biopic angle, like him as a person, because um, we can talk about his work through his work. We don't need a biopic for that. But to look at the mm-hmm. person like from a biographical standpoint, the interesting thing is it started off. He started off as just a kid with a dream. And then he just got was completely consumed by the adventures he had and the awards he won and essentially like this walk by the time, even in the fifties, he was a walking legend um, in, in yeah. the circles he ran in. And that does something to people that does something to your psyche. That makes it hard uh, to um, hard to be a real person in a lot of ways. And what, what does that mean for you as a person when you try to exist like that, like that, I would have, I would have loved to see something like that explored in a biopic Unfortunately, we didn't get that. Maybe it's because he's French and we didn't have a lot of his personal <laughs> thoughts down anywhere. Although a lot of that could also be just chalked up to 1960s toxic masculinity. But, you know, essentially we'll, we'll just never know a lot of these really interesting things. So we're left with made up stories about what it could have been like to be someone who's famous and have everyone adore you. But also everyone not really understand who you are as an individual outside of the adventures you have, uh, which is exactly point- what's presented in The Life Aquatic. I was going to say, at that point, either watch The Life Aquatic or The Aviator, and you get the same yeah. idea. Yeah. The Aviator actually kind of tackles almost the same thing and yeah, that's does what a saying. much better job of it. Yeah. Um, so it's possible. It's definitely possible. It's just, I don't know, they did, didn't do it. Yeah. And that's a bummer. Um, but alas, so it is, so it goes. I feel like we're sliding into overall notes. Should we yeah, slide there? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's cool. Let's go into overall. All right, I love the I love the futurism. I love the inspiration. I feel like that's the biggest takeaway from Jacques Cousteau is um, he set out to inspire the world to care about the ocean, and he succeeded. Yeah, yeah, um, and even just like the way that he talks about things, and this is actually something that they kind of touch on in the Odyssey too. Is like the at the very beginning when his captain goes up to explain what they were trying to do with. Uh, um, 18 meters deep and he kind of stutters and then Jacques Cousteau steps up and he explains it really eloquently and with a lot of poetry and the language and stuff like that. And that is really one of the things that makes his film so unique is, and I think this is again, one of those things that, you know, kind of goes hand in hand with the way that like Rod Serling would write for the Twilight Zone and stuff like that, but just presenting it in this very like poetic and interesting way uh, of besides just showing it, but explaining it, making you feel it and, and putting it in a bigger scope, like even just calling them oceanauts immediately makes you think of what you're watching in like this really grand, uh, kind of a way, um, good branding. 
Yeah, it is good branding, but it's also just good Im- imagination. Like it's inspiration. It's it's uh, it just kind of opens you up to a whole bunch of other thoughts and kind of puts you back in this time when, like you were saying, technological futurism, like what is possible? What is out there? Even though some of these things didn't work out, the attempt and the the base point of where it could lead is so cool to watch. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all about, and everything he does is all about exactly that. It's all about the future. Um, yeah. It's it's all f- so forward-looking and so just daring you to explore everything you can um, and explore things that he's explored and all that. Stuff. It's really cool. So there's there's a uh, term that I came across on the Wikipedia page um, called uh, di di oh gosh divulgation divulg divulgationism basically divulging what? or telling <laughs> explaining what it's it's a really difficult to pronounce word that just means pop sci so basically the there's this idea that Cousteau kind of invented a type of science or science ish entertainment that brings some of those elements but explains them in a really simple way that makes it easy for you know, non-scientists to understand. So it's kind of bridging this gap between like a scientific treatise where you would say, you know, here we put these guys in this tank that was under pressure and these are the effects that were on them and here's what we do going forward. And instead it just kind of presents some of the ideas in a way that's easy to understand uh, and is entertaining on top of that. And that kind of becomes pop sci, which is this whole trend. There's like a huge world of it now that, everyone knows about where, you know, from the crocodile hunter to bear grills to, uh, you know, YouTube, like Mark Rober and, uh, you know, all these other science people who kind of blend science ideas and, uh, entertainment and putting, you know, a a kind of surface level of really infotainment. Yeah. Infotainment kind of a thing. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from Jacques Rousseau. He had these shows that would inspires people to learn about nature and stuff like that. And again, Nat Geo and the uh, the Discovery Richard Channel and all that Bora. kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they all kind of are jumping off of this point that I think Cousteau had a huge part in in popularizing and making a a viable medium for uh, entertainment and content. No, that's important. It's a really important reason that so many people actually care about uh why people care about nature now because they've seen it on TV they've been entertained by it um i mean we're we're actually we're kind of seeing a new movement of it which is really interesting jonathan we're seeing a lot of people get back into nature uh over the past year as it's become an escape not only during quarantine but as it's become more and more popular on instagram which has always been popular to do like nature photography on instagram but the whole idea of kind of like almost these Jacques Cousteau-esque mini adventures out into nature or national parks have become more and more popular. And it's almost in the same same vein in a certain way. Now, I yeah. haven't seen anyone take a boat and go plow through a sheet <laughs> of ice. Um, but, you know, uh, going up into the mountains, taking some pictures with your dog, that kind of thing. Almost kind of you could see how that splits off of the same evolutionary tree. You know what? That's yeah. And there's another strain of entertainment that I see a lot on Vimeo uh, called travelogues. And it's not always nature, but it's usually like cities and stuff. But it's just always 100 percent a travelogue. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought about that. But that's exactly maybe the same kind of of the first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also like from the from a documentary uh, format perspective, I think it's really interesting having Jacques Cousteau as like this persona who grounds the whole thing. So it's not just a movie about, so kind of like in his TV shows where he has Rod Serling do the narration and stuff, having Jacques Cousteau be the one making the film and telling you about the film is, is really cool. And it's, it's makes the whole thing kind of more personal. So you can see like where his head is at when he's talking about them clubbing sharks or when he's talking about the, the majesty of Antarctica and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that the way that he formats his documentaries is, is also, uh, you know, very personal and also kind of gives rise to the way that a lot of these infotainment are, are not only centered around the information that's being presented, but also around the presenter who is presenting the information. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that personality plays a big role in it. And Jacques Cousteau, if if anyone else did a, a tried to do narration in his style, they would be about as interesting as a rock. But like for some reason, he pulls it off. Yeah, I, I can't tell you what it is, um, but and maybe it it's something about his passion for what he's talking about, even though he's so monotone is just just bleeds through into the narration so well um it's there it's present you can recognize it and you really like it i think we should mention that um you know there are still some not so great elements of Cousteau's legacy oh for sure Um, so there's (laughs) like you know like like we mentioned with the odyssey one of the things that the odyssey brings up is that a lot of Cousteau's adventures were funded by the french petroleum industry and basically giving rise to undersea oil drilling. Um, and there's also apparently his, one of his museums uh, located in Monaco uh, is, is identified as introducing this like killer algae into the Mediterranean mm-hmm, ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, that's, I mean, that's part of, that's part of the aspect of travel and adventure is, you know, transporting, organisms from one ecosystem to another where they're not supposed to be, uh, which can always have detrimental effects. And sometimes it's almost impossible to avoid that happening. Uh, but it's still something that that happens. Oh, yeah. 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 That's actually that's one of the biggest problems in a lot of uh, ocean can, and waterway conservati- uh, conser- conservation movements is algae. That's a big problem. And a lot of it was moved basically accidentally. People didn't know. Uh, and now we do, um, yeah. but unlike clubbing a shark, it's hard to stop. Um, right. But you can't club just one. Uh, <laughs> oh, my oh my gosh! All right. Uh, but yeah, no, I totally understand. Yeah, it's not great, but they also and they do continue to keep wor- they do keep working to try to improve it. And I think at this point, that's really all you can ask is to try yeah, to just do better keep getting and fix better. what you've done wrong. Um, so that's good. Uh, yep. A lot of it is a process of learning, which isn't an excuse. It's just an explanation. So, you know, here we are now. Um, don't club a shark, kids. Yep. Hey, hey, man, at least they didn't club any baby seals. At least they at sorted least it they out did not. in 1976. Yeah. yeah. Um, All right, Jonathan, shall we talk about what we're going to talk about next month on the podcast? I'm very excited because Me I've too. been looking for an excuse to watch every uh, <laughs> movie made by this person for a long time, and I finally have it. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this episode since I watched a uh, um, one of the Every Frame of, of Paintings, which I think you're familiar mm-hmm. with. Oh, yeah, I've um, seen it. I also read his autobiography, which is really good. Oh, that's um, exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Also somebody with a few mistresses. <laughs> okay we'll get into all that next month but we're gonna be talking about <laughs> look there's 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 a cost benefit thing if you want to be a legend you're probably not going to have the best family life there's a few people who pulled that <laughs> off but it is not common i'm not yeah. saying that you should aim f- for being a terrible family person but i'm saying it's pretty common yep yep uh so yeah we're gonna be talking about jackie chan and uh we're gonna be watching his films Drunken Master from 1978, Police Story from 1985, Super Cop from 1992, and The Foreigner, more recently from 2017. It's going to be a wild and wacky ride. Oh my gosh, I love Jackie Chan so much. They're such, like, just fun movies. Like, they're not, it's not that they're not deep, it's just that they're some of the most accessible, fun, visually charming pieces also, out there just technically lots of and technically brilliant and impressive so much skill and love put into yeah. it lots of people hurt in the making of these movies um <laughs> not one uh, of them was jackie chan no i'm just kidding no it was frequently jackie chan <laughs> it was it was almost always jackie chan um he's he's a really good boss actually he's one of those guys who's like uh i won't i wouldn't make you do anything i want to do and then he does it and hurts himself. He's like, well, I guess yeah. I'm glad I didn't make you do it. But also um, <laughs> he can do like 10 times more than any normal person. Dude, okay, so I'm just going to say a tidbit right now from the autobiography that I find really charming. 
uh, because this is from when Jackie Chan was like in his early 20s and he's so proud of it in the book and it because I listened to the audio book and he, he's just so clearly so proud of this fact um, but when he this was teaser a teaser for next man, month people listen up yeah so when he was a stuntman like really early on like when he was doing stuff for like Bruce Lee um, he play, had to play dead a lot and he was very proud of being one of the best people at playing dead and having directors compliment him on being so good at playing dead. And he was like, and here's the secret. Everyone else would start holding their breath when they rolled action, but I would wait a few seconds because I knew the camera wasn't on me yet, and then I'd hold my breath, and then I'd actually look dead on screen, and I wouldn't breathe. Um, and he's, it's like, it's kind of a tiny thing, but like to hear this like 60, 70 something year old man be so proud of this, is so charming like he's so and and that's just kind of like a sample of how proud he is of his craft and all the things he accomplishes like he puts a lot of love in it he's super passionate about it and it shows in everything he does uh even the movies i've watched of his already i'm going to rewatch for this next month because they're so good yeah that's awesome uh and he does not have a small canon either uh no he's done like five five bajillion movies (laughs) starred in cameoed in or uh, you know, had a bit role before he got big. There's his IMDb page is so long. It really is. It really is. All right, Jonathan, what are we talking about on the bonus podcast? Yeah. So if you would like to support us, you can head over to Patreon. Uh, anyone can join us in the discord, but if you support us on Patreon, you will also get to listen to our podcast recordings live. Uh, and you will also get access to the bonus podcast. And last month on the bonus podcast, we talked about every single one of the Cartoon Saloon shorts. Uh, So that was a lot of fun to go along with one (laughs) to go along with that episode. And this month, which will be coming out next week, we're going to be talking about the new release uh, on HBO Max in the Heights. Uh, And we both have some, I'm sure, very interesting perspectives on that. Uh, So, yeah, that's what we've got going on with our support. We would greatly appreciate it. Yep, that's all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at, at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alice Garinger. And I'm at the Blue Jay 1994. And if I links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. And from an American perspective, like accents are always just make it a little more interesting for good or oh, bad. Oh, yes, is a French accent. <laughs> oh, I have 16 mistresses. <laughs> I, I think we should also. I <laughs> unavailable. I am rude to foreigners. Oh, gosh. All right. Well, I there goes on your pronunciation. I don't know if we had any uh, French audience, but I don't know if we, we will. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're gone.